君に出場の招待状が届いているのだおスネーク参加してみる気はないか、うん、ところで君は今どこにいるんだね偵察に夢中だ偵察うん一体何を敵を知ることこそ勝利への近道だからな That's right. We've arrived at the company that many believe will smoke Sega, earning themselves the title of King of Dead franchises. Now, Konami is the godfather of some of the most iconic franchises in video game history Silent Hill, Metal Gear, Pro Evolution Soccer, Yu Gi Oh! I could go on. But what many don't realize is just how many franchises Konami has under its belt. The problem is that many of these franchises have either been abandoned or forgotten over the years, with Konami themselves hesitant when it comes to developing and releasing new games for them. Not to worry though, as in this video, we will be discussing and going through all of them, and figuring out the current state that they're in. The infamous tier list, as always, makes its grand return, along with the criteria that only franchises that have more than one game will be included, as well as having a release in the West at some point. With all of that out of the way, let's find out once and for all the depressing state Of every Konami. Oh shit, sorry. I mean, the current state of every Konami franchise. Konami would start its journey all the way back in 1969 as a jukebox rental and repair shop in Osaka. By 1973, founder Kagemasa Kazuki had been joined by Yoshinobu Nakama and Tatsuo Miyasako, where they transformed the jukebox rental and repair business into a manufacturer of amusement machines for video arcades. At the same time, the company donned the name Konami, which was a portmanteau of the names of its three founding members Kaigamasa Kazuki, Yoshinobu Nakama, and Tatsuo Miyasako. While the word Konami stood for little waves in Japanese, the resulting waves that would go on to create would be anything but little. During its earliest years, Konami would produce electronic games for arcades, the earliest of which being Blockyard in 1977. Very little information exists regarding the first game. Not to worry though, as the following year, Konami would release another four games, all of which were pretty much just clones of Atari's breakout. These were popular among players in Japanese department stores, leading Konami to continue developing similar games for the next few years. Now, I say they were popular, but these little releases here and there weren't enough to cement Konami as a household name within the video game industry. Well, at least that was the case until 1981, when they released Scramble. Scramble was actually the first side scrolling shooter with forced scrolling and multiple distinct levels. Players took control of a futuristic aircraft, simply referred to as a jet, which came equipped with a forward firing weapon as well as some bombs. Players would guide the jet through six different terrains, each featuring its own set of obstacles to avoid. It essentially established the foundation for a whole new genre and would go on to become Konami's first major worldwide hit. Within months, it sold over 15,000 arcade units in the US alone. Its success led to the production and release of a sequel titled Super Cobra, which was released later that same year. Super Cobra featured similar gameplay to Scramble. This time around, though, players took control of a helicopter as they navigated it through tight caverns. Equipped with a laser and bombs, players would destroy defenders, tanks, and UFOs while infiltrating 10 Super Cobra defense systems. Like its predecessor, Super Cobra would go on to become a commercial success, selling well over 12,000 arcade cabinets. Despite it being Konami's first worldwide hit, it doesn't seem as if Konami wanted to continue the franchise. The series would end up taking the first spot in the dead tier on our list. Now, upon tasting this worldwide fame and success, Konami couldn't get enough, as it would follow up Scramble with one of the most recognized video game franchises ever. Forget why did the chicken cross the road? How about why did the frog cross the road? Well, apparently, this frog crossed the road to help Konami achieve worldwide fame. Frogger, which was first released all the way back in 1981, has gone on to become one of the most influential and recognized series in gaming history. The goal was simple you, as the player, simply had to guide a frog to each of the empty homes at the top of the screen. The problem was, this frog, for whatever reason, had built its house on the other side of a busy road that had cars, trucks, and even bulldozers speeding through it. And if that wasn't enough, this poor frog had to also navigate over a river that had moving logs, turtles, and even alligators. Upon its release, the game was praised for its addictive gameplay and ability to attract players of all ages. It also garnered the ominous distinction of being the arcade game with the most ways to die. The game would be ported to several systems, with it selling extremely well on the majority of them. Following the success of this first game, the series would explode to include numerous sequels, remakes, and spin offs. In total, there have been 34 games branding the Frogger name, which have consistently been released to this day. Unfortunately, if we were to just count console releases, this would take us back to 2011, with Frogger 3D on the 3DS. 
The last handful of games have been relegated to mobile releases, and it seems as though this is where the franchise will stay, at least for a while. Even so, players still compete against one another on the original arcade game, looking to push the world record higher, with the highest score actually being set recently back in 2022 by Michael Smith. With over 33 million units sold, it's safe to say that this franchise definitely holds a top spot in Konami's shaky lineup. Konami would follow up Frogger with another directional shooter called Time Pilot. Players took control of another futuristic fighter and were tasked with rescuing fellow pilots trapped in different time periods. The jet would remain in the center of the screen the whole time and would fly across an open airspace that scrolled indefinitely. Each time period came with its own mothership boss that once defeated would shift players to the next time period. The game performed well, falling within the top 5 highest grossing arcade games of 1982. A top-down sequel, titled Time Pilot 84, would release a few years later in, well, 1984. And while it featured similar gameplay to its predecessor, it would replace the time travel motif with a simpler setting that took place over a futuristic landscape. The sequel wouldn't receive the same level of success as its predecessor though, and the franchise as a whole would end following its release. Time Pilot 84 would go on to be re-released for the Switch in 2021 as part of the Arcade Archive series, but even taking this into account, it's most likely a dead franchise. Now here's where things get a bit interesting, as this next franchise wasn't originally owned nor developed by Konami. In fact, this franchise was the first major success of another company that today no longer exists. The company in question was known as Hudson Soft, and the franchise that developed was Bomberman. Now you may be wondering why I'm mentioning all of this in a Konami video. Well that's because back in 2012, Hudson Soft actually merged with Konami Digital Entertainment, becoming a fully owned subsidiary of Konami. As a result, Konami now owns all the assets of Hudson, but as we'll continue to see throughout the rest of this video, it's hard to tell if they even realise that they own so many of these long lost franchises. Fortunately enough though, Bomberman happens to be one of the few that they do seem to care about, and that's likely because of the immense success the series has received. The series began all the way back in 1983, and followed the titular character Bomberman as he navigated through a maze full of enemies. The doors leading to further maze rooms were hidden under rocks, and the only way to discover them was to destroy these rocks with bombs. This simplistic gameplay loop has remained the core driving force for the series as a whole, and the large majority of its 70 plus games stick to this core structure, with a few of its spin-offs incorporating platformer, puzzle and kart racing gameplay. Funnily enough, the series saw countless games during the late 90s and early 2000s, pretty much up until Konami took over. Since that fateful day though, the franchise has released a pitiful number of games. On a positive note though, Super Bomberman R, despite being a mediocre game, actually sold extremely well, marking it as the franchise's top selling game to this day. The success of this game most likely gave Konami that much needed slap to get it back into gear and start developing more games, with the sequel Super Bomberman R2 scheduled for release later this year. All in all, the series has sold over 13 million copies, and despite it slowing down considerably in the last few years, it still manages to remain towards the the top of Konami's library. Now towards the end of 1983, Konami secured the rights to develop a game based on the upcoming 1984 Summer Olympics. Known as track and field in the US and Hyper Olympic in Japan and Europe, this game had players compete in a series of events, most of which simply played by pressing two buttons as quickly as possible. You had events like the 100 meter dash, long jump, high jump, and even javelin throw. And despite the simplicity of the gameplay, the game was a worldwide success in arcades, becoming the most successful arcade game of 1984. Following its release, Konami and Century held a video game competition that drew more than a million players internationally, smashing the record for the largest organized video game competition of all time. This game was so influential, it led to the resurgence of arcade sports games, and was said to have inspired Namco's side-scrolling platformer Pac-Man back in 1984. Konami would follow up track and field with numerous sequels, with each new edition offering a plethora of new events and playable characters. The latest game in this franchise dates back to 2010, with Hypersports track and field for iOS. The series did get a brief glimpse of a revival back in 2018, when a new reimagining of the 1984 game Hypersports was initially revealed as a Switch exclusive under the name Hypersports. Sports R. Unfortunately, after years without news, Konami would update their very own website expressing their plans to discontinue development on Hypersports R, with no specific reasons as to why. Honestly, as much as I think this is probably a dead franchise, this failed revival gives me just enough hope to move it into the zombie tier. Konami would move towards the racing genre with their next franchise, but this wasn't your typical racer. In fact, I want you to picture a racing game in your mind. Got one? Alright, is this what you were imagining? No? I mean that's okay, I'm sure we're all thinking the same thing. How the fuck is this a racing game? Well, as strange as it seems, Antarctic Adventure had players take control of a penguin named Penta as he raced from station to station within the time limit, all while avoiding sea lions and breaks in the ice. Throughout the levels, fish can be seen jumping out of ice holes and can actually be caught for extra points. 
As was the case with a lot of games back then, this game had no official ending and would continue indefinitely along with increasing difficulty. Antarctic Adventure was followed by a sequel called Penguin Adventure, which also happened to be the professional debut of legendary game designer Hideo Kojima, a name I'm sure many of you recognise. And if you don't, well, we'll definitely be getting into his iconic resume later on, that's for sure. This sequel would greatly expand on the gameplay of its predecessor, adding not only a greater variety of stages and enemies, but also incorporating RPG elements in the form of boss fights, purchasable items, and numerous minigames. The franchise did eventually get a set of digital comics, but outside of that, it's without a doubt, a dead one. On this channel, I've talked a lot about how the 90s were dominated by the fighting game genre, but not so much about where the basis for these games originated from. Karate Champ, a 1984 arcade game, is often credited as one of the most influential games that helped popularise the one-on-one -on -one fighting game genre. But what people don't realise is that alongside this was another game. This game went by the name of Yi R Kung Fu and was Konami's first step into the fighting game genre. Inspired by the very same Karate Champ as well as Bruce Lee to the point where their main character Oolong was modelled after Lee, the game had players fighting against a set of martial arts masters. At their fingertips was an impressive set of 16 different moves that could be executed through different combinations of buttons and joystick movements. While Karate Champ used the point scoring system, ER Kung Fu introduced a health meter system which has gone on to become the standard format in the fighting game genre to this day. The game as you'd expect was a commercial success, quickly becoming the highest grossing arcade conversion kit of 1985 in the US. ER Kung Fu would get its very own sequel soon after as well as a spiritual successor in the form of a beat-em-up called Shaolin's Road. Unfortunately, this is where the franchise ends, with Konami seemingly having no interest in continuing it. Now we're back with the racing games, and no don't worry, this time I ain't pulling your leg, we've got your standard racer this time around. Funnily enough though, the gameplay of Road Racer was strangely similar to that of Antarctic Adventure, except instead of going between stations with a time limit, players were tasked with reaching the finish line within the time limit. Players would be forced to dodge in this game as well, but instead of sea lines, it was cars. But not all cars, see, you had to hit some cars to refill your fuel tank while avoiding the rest. Despite being Konami's first typical racer, the game actually performed surprisingly well, garnering a spot as the most successful table arcade unit of the month. Road Fighter was initially followed by two sequels, as well as the spiritual successor in Konami GT. At this point, it seemed as though this was just another dead franchise, but seemingly out of nowhere, Konami would temporarily revive the franchise when they released Road Fighters in 2010, which to this day has remained a Japanese exclusive. This little bump though, I believe, gives this franchise just enough fighting power to move up to the zombie tier. And if you don't agree, well, let's just say Konami needs all the help they can get. Now, following the explosive success of Namco's Xevious, a small team at Konami spearheaded by Hiroyasu Bachiguchi began work on a shoot'em up, with the goal being to surpass that very same Xevious. This game in particular took a lot of its elements from Scramble. Honestly, it's sometimes considered part of the same franchise, but I decided to separate them as I believe this is where the grittiest line of the games truly started. In this side-scrolling shooter, players took control of a spacecraft known simply as the Vic Viper and were tasked with defending themselves against a variety of alien enemies. One of the defining features of this game, which became synonymous with the series, was the introduction of the power meter, which could charge up and once highlighted, allowed players to use that specific power up. While Konami had initially planned to surpass Namco Xevious with Gradius, it unfortunately never did reach the same heights as its rival. Now this wasn't to say the game was a failure, far from it. In fact, the original Gradius placed within the top 5 highest grossing arcade games of 1986 and would spawn a long line of games and spin-off series as a result. Over its nearly 30 year lifespan, the Gradius franchise managed to pump out 16 games in total, with the latest Gradius The Slot taking us back to 2011. By this point though, the franchise known to be full of fun addictive shooters had seemingly dissolved into something else entirely. It's sad to see, but this too has become one of Konami's abandoned and dead franchises. Not to worry though, as like I said, Gradius was so big that it actually spawned numerous spin-off series. Surely one of these is still ongoing, right? <laughs> uh, anyway, the first of these went by the name Salamander and was released just a year after the original Gradius in 1986. Salamander featured similar gameplay to Gradius, but would introduce a more simplified power-up system, as well as a two-player cooperative mode, where player one controlled the Vic Viper, while player two takes the reins of a spacecraft called Lord British. Salamander, just like Gradius, garnered critical acclaim and was extremely popular upon its release. The subseries even got its own OVA miniseries, as well as a set of manga volumes and of course, its very own sequel, a decade later called Salamander 2. While it was similar in design, many fans believed it to be inferior to its predecessor. While it garnered some moderate success in arcades, apart from a few re-releases on future consoles, unfortunately, like its parent franchise Gradius, Salamander has also died off. Now in hopes of keeping this giant series afloat, Konami would release another spin-off franchise, this time going by the name Parodius. The Parodius subseries differentiated itself by taking a more light-hearted approach with its gameplay, 
As you may have figured from its name, Proteus games were a set of parodies of Gradius, and are what people like to refer to as cute em ups, featuring many of the characters from Konami's other franchises. In total, this subseries released six games between 1988 and 1997, with the latest, Paro Wars, actually being its own spin off of the Parodia series. Of these six games, only two were ever released outside Japan, these being From Myth to Laughter in 1990 and Fantastic Journey in 1994, both of which received a European localization. Funnily enough, the fact that these games never made it to the US actually helped them win the award Best Game That Never Came Out in the US in 1992. Outside of that though, this series like the two before it has unfortunately fallen to the wayside. Konami's last attempt at resurrecting this confusing franchise came in the form of Otome Dias back in 2007. This side-scrolling shooter was the first arcade shooter since Gradius IV Resurrection back in 1999. And if you hadn't realised by now, Konami loves using portmanteaus, evidenced by their very own company name, as well as parodies. And it shouldn't come as a surprise to hear that Atome DS was also a portmanteau of the terms Atome, meaning Maiden Game, and Gradius. The Atome aspect comes into play with the personification of the game's space fighters, now being represented by anthropomorphic anime girls. Aside from that though, the gameplay was relatively similar to its previous counterparts and was surprisingly well received for the most part. The series would get a sequel titled Otoma DS Excellent four years later in 2011, but unlike its predecessor, this one wouldn't receive the same love. Despite offering a plethora of new playable characters and a multiplayer mode, then he found the difficulty to be frustratingly annoying and off-putting, essentially killing off the series' potential and leaving us with yet another dead franchise. Now moving away from the shooter genre. Oh, never mind. Guess I forgot this was very popular back during this era. It seems that after witnessing the success of Gradius, Konami wanted to double dip back into the shoot 'em up genre when they released Twinbee in 1985. Often being credited as an early archetype for the shoot 'em up genre, Twinbee had players take control of, of the cartoon like anthropomorphic spacecraft Twinbee as they fought their way through countless enemies using both their guns and bombs. Twin B allowed the two players to play simultaneously, with player 1 taking control of titular character Twin B, and player 2 in charge of his female counterpart, Win B. Twin B went on to become the third most successful table arcade unit of the month, and helped spawn numerous sequels. Over its long lifespan, Twin B series has blessed us with 16 games, the latest of which being Line Go Go, a classic Twin B shooter for iOS and Android, released back in 2013. Outside of video games, the series has also managed to have its very own radio drama, two short anime films, an OVA miniseries, as well as numerous manga releases. Despite all this though, the series itself hasn't had much action in over a decade now, meaning at most, it's likely a zombie tier franchise. For real this time, we are moving away from the shooter genre and into the realm of platformers, as Konami's next release, King's Valley, would have players take on the role of an intrepid adventurer whose goal was to collect various gems all while evading angry mummies and other monsters. King's Valley incorporates puzzle-like elements by limiting the number of cutting and drilling equipment available to the player. Should you use these in the wrong order, you would end up stuck, meaning you would have to replay the whole level again. There's not much information on how well this game performed, but it must have done decently well, as the game would get a sequel titled King's Valley 2 a few years later in 1988. King's Valley 2 played essentially the same as its predecessor, but featured more pyramids, levels, and tools. In hopes of bringing more eyes to this obscure game, Rebit Magazine took it upon themselves to develop an port of the original game, which did eventually eventually get released a few years ago, now with updated graphics. Despite this though, as well as the game's elaborate and unique setting, it seems Konami themselves grew tired of it, and at least officially, any news regarding this franchise since. I guess Konami couldn't stay away from shooters, as their next franchise following King's Valley, Nightmare, returned to the format barely a year later. You took control of Popolom, a warrior on the quest to rescue Princess Aphrodite from the evil priest Adnos. Like many of the scrolling shooters at the time, the levels in which you played through wouldn't stop moving until a boss fight, meaning you had to avoid or destroy the numerous enemies and obstacles blocking your path. Upon its release, Nightmare garnered critical acclaim, with many describing it as a must-have for fans of the shoot-em-up genre. It should be no surprise that this success eventually led to the production of two sequels, The Maze of Galios, as well as Shalom Nightmare 3, both of which released a year later in 1987. Following these though, fans would fall into their very own nightmare, as months passed without any news. These months turned to years, which turned to decades, and still, Konami hadn't uttered a word regarding this once popular series. Even so, I must hand it to the fans, as they took it upon themselves to keep the franchise alive. Over the years, there have been countless unofficial remakes and ports of the original Nightmare, with many containing new features, improved graphics, and numerous enhancements. And what could be considered good news? Back in 2021, Konami announced an indie game contest that actively asked smaller developers to make games based on some of their classic series, like Gradius, and of course, Nightmare. I guess only time will tell if anything comes from this push in regards to this franchise. For now, I'd say the community are the only ones keeping it from fully passing away.
Moving on to one of Konami's more successful series, we have Ganbare Goemon, a series of action-adventure games that at one point seemed to be on their way to universal stardom. The series would make its first appearance with Mr. Goemon back in 1986, and had players to control the main character, Goemon, a noble thief which had been loosely based on Ishikawa Goemon, the noble thief of Japanese folklore. While the majority of Goemon games read themselves in action-adventure style gameplay, the series has branched out to include RPGs, puzzle games, as well as board games. In total, including spin-offs, the series offers a whopping 30 games, but due to Konami believing that the game's settings and characters are too specific to the Japanese market, only 5 of these games have ever released overseas. Their series would continue to garner praise among Japanese fans, and even received its very own anime and manga series. Even so, seeing as there hasn't been a new game since 2005, I think we can say that Konami has once again dropped the ball. It just so happens this ball was Ganbare Goemon, and what they dropped it into was the dead tier. We've arrived at another one of Hudson Soft's creations with Star Soldier. Now, Star Soldier was a series of scrolling shooters, of course, that drew inspiration and are often regarded as spiritual successors to Tecmo's Star Force. As such, the game pulls a lot of its elements from that game and features very similar gameplay in which players take control of a spacecraft, Caesar, as they travel through space stations destroying powerful supercomputers known as Star Brains. Following its debut, the franchise would expand to include 14 different games, including some compilations and remakes. The last three games consisted of a Wii Wear release and two mobile games. Outside of that though, this series like many of Hudson Soft's has fallen victim to neglect and unfortunately has been laid to rest in the dead tier. To make things worse, we're not quite done with Hudson Soft yet either. As the next franchise on this list, Adventure Island seemed to receive similar treatment to Star Soldier. Adventure Island was a side-scrolling platformer in which players played as Master Higgins, a young man who ventured to Adventure Island in hopes of rescuing Princess Tina. Adventure Island was an adaption of Sega's Wonder Boy, with which it drew some of its gameplay elements from. Much like Wonder Boy, Master Higgins starts without the ability to attack must pick up stone axes that can be used as either weapons or traded for magical fireballs, which had longer range and were capable of destroying rocks and rolling stones. Upon its release, the game garnered a lukewarm reception, with many on the fence due to its challenging nature and fast-paced action. Even so, Hudson believed in the game's potential, and within the next decade, numerous sequels and ports had been developed and released for the franchise, with the last three games consisting of a WiiWare release and two mobile releases. Now that should sound familiar, that's because I literally just copied and pasted that exact sentence from the previous franchise, Star Soldier, and despite this, it still perfectly describes the current state of Adventure Island. I think we all know where this franchise places when taking that into account. Finally, we've arrived at one of the titans of Konami. But just because I've given it that cool title doesn't mean that Konami has been treating it too well. Now after a slew of shooter maps, I'm sure players weren't ready for what Konami had in store next. Clad in light armor and equipped with his trusty magic whip, Vampire Killer, players were introduced to what would become one of the most iconic characters in the gaming industry, Simon Belmont. A descendant of a legendary vampire hunter, it was up to Simon to rid the world of Count Dracula, who had reappeared a hundred years after his ancestors had already vanquished him. That was the general premise of Castlevania, the next franchise on this list. I'm sure most of you know of this franchise, it's widely considered to be one of the greatest NES games of all time, due to its dark setting, addictive gameplay and iconic soundtrack. Now Konami knew it was on to a winner here, and for the next two decades or so, actually released countless games to the franchise, but this seemed to backfire, as over time, sales figures for each Castlevania game began to slow down. This lasted until the 2010s, when Konami would make a crucial decision. What they decided to do was essentially shadow drop a reboot of the series, which had originally been announced as Lord of the Shadows at the 2008 Leipzig Games Convention, with no relation to Castlevania. This was done as an announcement of this caliber would upstage another upcoming series release with Castlevania Judgment, the series' first fighting game. But alas, on the 5th of October 2010, Castlevania Lords of Shadow would release. This reboot of the series followed Gabriel Belmont, now in a 3D setting as he fought, swung and slayed anything from vampires to trolls. This game in particular distanced itself from the typical Castlevania games in hopes of drawing in new fan, while still keeping some of the core elements of the series in hopes of not alienating franchise fans. While it was a risk, it was one that actually paid off as Lords of Shadows garnered very positive reviews and went on to become the fastest and best selling Castlevania game in history. This success resulted in Konami themselves requesting the production of two more titles and within the next few years both Mirror of Fate and Lords of Shadow 2 were released. Unfortunately, following the lackluster sales and underwhelming reviews, this subseries like the main line halted its growth. 
Nowadays, the Castlevania series has seemingly tapered off, with the latest games being either spin-offs or compilations of its earlier games. Upon witnessing the success of the game's latest collaboration with Dead Cells, Konami would actually express heavy interest in developing newer entries, which is a good sign for the future of the franchise. With over 24 million units shipped, it is without a doubt one of Konami's biggest and most successful franchises. It's hard to say where to place this, but I think just through its name alone, it has to be in flagships. Now after the smash hit, Konami would shift their way over to the sporting genre, where they would release Double Dribble, an arcade basketball game that for its time was considered the most realistic basketball video game. This game had it all, fast paced action, detailed players, a large side scrolling court, detailed sound effects and even its very own innovative cinematic slam dunks, which helped it garner popularity among fans of the sport. The game would be followed by Double Dribble The Playoff Edition in 1994, which now featured three modes of play, Expedition, Multiplay and Playoff. The series would get its very own Game Boy version in 1991 with Double Dribble 5 on 5, as well as a remake for iOS titled Double Dribble Fast Break, which was released back in 2010. This would also mark their latest game in the series, and since then, there hasn't been any news relating to a new entry. Considering Konami's focus at the moment, I don't think this series will ever see a revival. Not to worry though, as Konami would follow up Double Dribble with a series that, like Castlevania, would go on to become one of their more successful franchises. The franchise in question was none other than Contra, a series of run and gun style shooter games where players would take control of an armed commando as he blasted his way through all sorts of extraterrestrial monsters. The original Contra was released all the way back in 1987, and its core features such as power-ups, two-player co-op, and the unique lightness of its character's mobility became synonymous with the rest of the games in the series. Contra also incorporated Pseudo 3D views in which players would have to shoot and move towards the background in order to proceed to the next area. Upon its release, the game experienced worldwide success, quickly becoming one of the highest grossing arcade games of 1987. This immediate success led to the game being ported to numerous consoles, with its NES counterpart becoming recognised as one of the most iconic games of its generation. Since its initial release, the franchise has released over 20 games, and while sales numbers haven't been updated in decades, it's safe to say that it's heavily implied to be in the higher millions. The series' latest release, Contra Rogue Corps, which was released in 2019, featured a top-down isometric view that wasn't received too well with many criticising its seemingly bland gameplay and story, as well as the addition of a season pass that added nothing of substance. Even so, considering the franchise has had a somewhat consistent release cycle over its lifespan, and it's still being recognised in other aspects with its very own board game and movie, I think it can be placed within the mainstays tier. Now after Contra, there's no way Konami's next franchise could live up to the Remember what de Gaulle said. Alright, never mind. I'm sure when you're asked to think of a Konami franchise, Metal Gear for sure has to be one of the first to come to mind. It quickly cemented itself as one of the most groundbreaking and respected franchises in the gaming industry. The genius behind this awe-inspiring series was none other than Hideo Kojima. I told you we'd come back to him. Kojima originally had been tasked with developing an action game after taking over a project from a senior associate. Due to the MSX2's limited hardware, Kojima believed it would limit the number of on-screen bullets and enemies, impeding the combat aspect of the game. So instead, Kojima looked to shift the gameplay to a more stealth-like focus, in which the game's titular character, Solid Snake, would look to avoid capture altogether. Upon being discovered, the game would shift into a puzzle video game, much like Pac-Man, where enemy guards would behave like ghosts as they sought out the player. This unique take was revolutionary for the time, and the first Metal Gear game went on to become a major international hit, quickly selling over 1 million units on the NES in the US alone. Its focus on stealth-like gameplay opened the doors to a whole new subgenre of action games, acting as the inspiration point for countless games that would release in the years to come. Up until 2015, Kojima remained the primary designer and producer of the series, at least for its mainline games. But following Metal Gear Solid 5: The Phantom Pain, Kojima would leave Konami to start his own companies known simply as Kojima Productions. While Kojima Productions would go on to develop more smash hits like the Death Stranding series, it also meant that Konami had to somehow keep the Metal Gear franchise afloat without their golden boy. Their first attempt arrived in 2018 with Metal Gear Survive, which didn't go down too well with fans and critics, with many considering it a generic action game that left a lot to be desired, as it had somehow lost the feeling of the previous Metal Gear games. Years would pass without any updates, but early this year, during Sony's PlayStation Showcase event, Konami would announce a remake of Snake Eater, titled Metal Gear Solid Delta Snake Eater. Alongside this was further news of a master collection, which would include the first five mainline games, which is set to release in the fall of 2023. Overall, there's no question this is one of Konami's flagships, but with Kojima's departure and the unstable nature of the franchise following its latest release, I guess only time will tell what truly becomes of this iconic franchise. It was only a matter of time before we
before we'd come across an F1 racing game. In fact, I'm surprised it took this long for Konami to get with the program. Regardless, Konami would eventually have its very own F1 franchise, fittingly named F1 Spirit. Now F1 Spirit, unlike a lot of the previous racing games, actually started off as a top-down racer in which players had to work their way up the ranks, so to speak, as they started in the standard stock cars before accumulating enough points to move up through rally cars, F3 cars, and finally the king of races, the F1 cars. With each new race type, the difficulty would increase, now featuring faster gameplay and more complex and difficult handling techniques. This gameplay format would continue with its two sequels, with F1 Spirit 3D Special in particular switching things up, now taking on a 3D based graphical style like Namco's pole position. The series would end off in 1991, with F1 Spirit on the Game Boy, which returned back to the top down perspective of the original. Hoping to resurrect the franchise in some regards, Brain Games would produce an unlicensed remake of the original F1 Spirit, which was released back in 2004. This remake retained much of the gameplay of the original, but had much more modernised physics and improved graphics. I think it's safe to say that despite Brain Games' best efforts, this franchise unfortunately happens to remain a dead one. Now this next franchise is a fairly obscure one, and I'm not even fully sure if it's owned by Konami. The series in question is the Crush Pinball franchise, which was a set of pinball games first developed by Compile before Hudson Soft took over. Despite sounding like your typical run-of-the-mill pinball games, this set of games distinguished itself with the presence of sci-fi, fantasy, and occult themes, as seen with the occult theme of skulls and demons in the original Devil's Crush, as well as the Japanese mythology theme with demons and ogres set up in the series' third game, Jackie Crush. The series had started off with four mainline entries before dying off, only to be revived in 2008 when Hudson Soft published a sequel to the original Alien Crush titled Alien Crush Returns. Due to Konami now owning Hudson Soft, it's believed that the IP of this franchise now belongs to Konami. Honestly though, I can't see this franchise ever coming back. Now, despite us closing in on the 90s by this point, the shooter genre was still by far the most popular both in terms of the players and the game developers. And Konami wasn't slowing down either, as they would release Thunder Cross, another horizontal scrolling shooter in 1988. Thunder Cross was your typical horizontal shooter, tasking players in control of the Thunder Fighter to fight their way through seven stages with the use of three different weapons. Bosses were present at the end of each level, and in typical Konami fashion, this game forced players to beat it twice on a harder loop the second time around. As was the case with many shooters at the time, the game was met with a positive reception and went on to become the second most successful table arcade unit at the time. This would inevitably lead to a sequel, Thunder Cross 2, which unfortunately never released outside of Japan. Most recently, this set of games has been re-released as part of the arcade archives on modern day consoles, but outside of that, I can't see the series ever coming back. Hudson Soft was back at it again, with their next franchise, which became known as Milon's Secret Castle. The game followed the titular character Milon, who had to fight his way through a four-story castle named Castle Garland, in hopes of rescuing Queen Eliza. Milon could run and jump, and had the ability to shoot bubbles, which not only helped in his fight against the many enemies prowling the castle floors, but it could also be used in other ways, like destroying blocks and revealing hidden shops and items. The game garnered a reputation for being extremely difficult and frustrating, as there were no save points, and once players ran out of lives, it was game over. The game would get its very own Japanese exclusive sequel, known as Doremi Fantasy, as well as a more modern port to the Wii Virtual Console. This port got absolutely decimated by critics, with some describing it as easily one of the worst games ever made. Following that rave review, and seeing as there hasn't been any mention from Konami since, I think it's safe to say that this franchise is also a dead one. Almost seems like Hudson Soft was developing more games than Konami at this point, as this next franchise was once again one of the many hidden gems Hudson produced. Nectaris, or Military Madness, was a series of sci-fi themed hex map turn based strategy games, released all the way back in 1989. Nectaris was one of the very first turn based strategy games and involved players moving units around a hex map into positions where they could engage in turn based encounters. By capturing factories, players were able to produce more resources and repair units, all of which would help in destroying the enemy forces. The game performed extremely well in Japan, but failed to make any waves in the US, mainly due to the fact that the system that it was released on, the TurboCraft 16, was getting clapped by Nintendo and Sega in the console market. As a result, and despite the series getting numerous sequels over the years, only one of them ever released outside of Japan, that being Military Madness, Nectaris, which was released on WiiWare, Xbox Live, and PlayStation Network in 2009. Unfortunately, following Neo Nectaris for iOS in 2010, the series has seemingly died off, never to be seen again. At this point, I may as well have titled this the current state of every Hudson Soft franchise, as once again, this next franchise was one of theirs. Dungeon Explorer was a 1989 ARPG, developed initially by Atlas, and more specifically the team that went on to develop the iconic RPG series, Megami Tensei. The game incorporated a top-down perspective, 
where players chose one of the game's eight classes, with each having their own unique set of abilities. Players would explore towns and fields before entering dungeons and defeating boss hidden away at the end of it. The game was positively received and is often cited as one of the benchmark titles that established a lot of typical ARPG elements. The game was followed by four sequels, the latest of which being Dungeon Explorer Warriors of Ancient Arts, which was released back in 2007. Unfortunately for this franchise, each new release was met with less and less excitement, and the quality of the game suffered as a result. As of the current day, this like many of Hudson's series has been completely left to rot. Finally, we can turn back to Konami for this next franchise, Crime Fighters. As the name suggests, this game was your typical side-scrolling beat-em-up, where players took control of a squad of undercover police officers. Crime Fighters allowed for up to four players to play at once, but had friendly fire where you could accidentally smack each other up, causing your friends to drop their weapons permanently. After bashing your way through different areas and defeating all the bosses, the game would throw players into one final gauntlet, a boss rush of sorts, where you must defeat all the bosses at once. Upon its release, the game was positively received, becoming the third most successful table arcade unit of its time. This led to a sequel titled Vendetta, which featured more of your typical beat-em-up fun. This iteration of the game actually received its fair share of censorship in some countries, which removed enemy characters who dressed in leather, implying some kind of S&M play, as well as enemies who upon grabbing the player would dry hump them and lick them. The series would also garner positive reception and prove financially successful, but despite this, it seemed like Konami wasn't willing to continue on with this franchise, as there hasn't been any news since. Well, would you look at that, another Hudson Soft series, this time going by the name Tengai Makio. Now this is a strange one, the original series was actually extremely popular in Japan, and alongside Enix's Dragon Quest and Squaresoft's Final Fantasy, were considered some of the best and most iconic RPG games during the 16-bit era. The series had originally been slated as a trilogy, but due to the mass appeal and national success the first few games experienced, it was unsurprisingly expanded upon to the point where it had numerous remakes, guidance, and genre spin-offs across a variety of platforms. And if it wasn't for these genre spin-offs, then this franchise wouldn't have made it onto this list, as the core set of RPG games actually remain Japanese exclusives to this day. What did make it over to the West then, I hear you asking? Well, honestly, it's probably the last thing you'd expect. Out of the long lineup of mainline games, remakes, and spin-offs, the only game to surface on the Western shores was actually a spin-off fighting game called Far East of Eden, Kabuki Clash. Despite the rest of the series selling over 2 million copies, the fact that this series never did break out into the West and hasn't received a new entry since 2005, I think it's safe to say that while it may have been one of the biggest series alongside Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy, it certainly couldn't keep up with them, and has since fallen off into the dead tier. Watch out for Shredder! Now that was always one of my favourite lines in the TMNT 2003 TV series, but that's not what we're here to talk about. In fact, any more than that tiny clip, and I'm sure Paramount would be on my ass about copyright. As a whole, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles media franchise needs no introduction, as it has cemented itself as one of the most recognised and distinguished franchises in history. From its early start with comic books to its multiple animated series, there are not many of us who grew up in the 90s or early 2000s who can't recognise this wholesome family of turtle ninjas. It should come as no surprise then that this gigantic franchise would ultimately get its own video game series, and luckily for us, Konami just so happened to play one of the largest roles in distributing them. The first of these games was a side-scrolling action platformer released in 1989 for the NES. This was one of the very first TMNT video games based on the animated series. The game played like your typical platformer, with players able to switch between the four turtles and use each of their iconic weapons as they fought their way through the Foot Clan or while eating pizza to replenish their health. This game would explode upon its release, selling over 4 million cartridges by the end of 1990. Knowing that these games would make them a lot of money, Konami continued to produce and publish games in the TMNT franchise, many of which were either fighting games or beat em ups. This lasted until 2005, when Konami would produce their last game based on the franchise, titled Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 Mutant Nightmare. 5 years passed, 10 years passed, and then 15, with no news or hints at a revival. It seemed like once again, Konami had abandoned the franchise. But coming into 2022, Konami seemed to have one last trick up their sleeve when they released the Cowabunga Collection. This in all honesty is just a compilation of TMNT video games, developed by Digital Eclipse and published by Konami. It includes 13 games, which had originally released between 1989 and 1994. And while it may not be a new original game, its recency and overall magnitude of the franchise does just enough to slot it into the it exists here. Konami's next franchise was Motocross Maniacs, a platforming racing game released back in 1989. In a similar style to Nintendo's Excite Bike, Motocross Maniac had plagues controlling a motorcycle horizontally as they jumped over obstacles and performed stunts in the air, 
while vying for record times through the 8 different levels. The game did have some replayability, letting players beat previous time records which were announced at the completion of a level. These couldn't be saved however, and all records were wiped upon turning off the Game Boy. The game was positively received and got two sequels, Motocross Maniacs in 1999 and Motocross Maniacs Advance in 2002, both of which involved similar gameplay but incorporated revamped graphics, selectable characters and newly designed 2.5D levels. After Motocross Maniacs Advance though, the series would cease to continue, allowing us to place it within the dead tier. And now Hudson Soft was on fire during this time period and would continue that streak after releasing Newtopia, an overhead action adventure game back in 1989. Now, Newtopia was believed to be Hudson Soft's rendition of Nintendo's Legend of Zelda series, as many of the game's elements could be linked back to the household title. Newtopia had players control Jezetta as he sets out to rescue Princess Aurora. Featuring a top down perspective, Newtopia involved players exploring spheres in order to recover two medallions. These medallions were hidden in crypts and were guarded by bosses. Throughout the game, players could interact with NPCs to gather information, as well as blow up walls and burn certain objects to reveal hidden secrets. Unfortunately for Newtopia, while it was considered a solid game, there seemingly wasn't a single critic out there that didn't believe it was just an inferior Zelda, with many just calling it Zelda but on PC. Even so, the game would eventually get its very own sequel with Newtopia 2 in 1991. This sequel shared many similarities with its predecessor, and as such was once again compared to the Zelda series, with the main drawbacks discussed being its lack of originality and simplistic puzzles. The series was at one point due for a third installment, fittingly titled Newtopia 3. This game however was only ever teased by Hudson Soft and would never actually materialise. Even so, homebrew developer Frozen Utopia wanted to continue the series and in 2005 would share a single in-game screenshot of the unofficial game. The latest update regarding this game would be in May of 2008, when Frozen Utopia stated that the project had been postponed due to the developers focusing on other projects. As this was over 15 years ago, I think it's safe to say that this franchise most likely won't ever be coming back. Bonk wasn't just your typical video game character, he was actually a former mascot for NEC's PC Engine or TurboGrafx video game console. Originally, Bonk was created as a comic character to push the new system in magazines, but after hearing that so many people actually liked the character, talks began discussing whether he should be given a game of his own. The Bonk didn't just receive one game, but upwards of a dozen over his short lifespan. Bonk would start its journey with Bonk's Adventure, a scrolling platform game released back in 1989. Now you may be wondering, why was his name Bonk? Well, if I'm being honest, Bonk went by a few names, those being PC Genshin in Japan and PC Kid in PAL regions, but his US name most likely originated due to his fighting technique, which involved him bonking enemies with his large invincible forehead. Bonk would collect pieces of meat as power-ups that allowed him to gain special abilities that would make him stronger. In the following years, Bonk went on numerous other adventures, with the latest all being developed by Hudson Soft and released for iOS devices during the late 2000s. Bonk's final days came back in 2009, when a new game developed by Pi Studios had been announced going by the name Bonk Brink of Extinction, which in itself is quite a telling name. This title looked to incorporate cooperative play, but was later cancelled by Hudson Soft among news concerning their merger with Konami. And despite a Konami spokesperson discussing the idea of continuing on with some of Hudson's titles, it seems Bonk wasn't part of that discussion. Arcade flyers were something else back in the day, I'm telling you. I mean, just look at this one. If it wasn't for Konami's logo at the bottom, I wouldn't even know it was an arcade game. Now despite the cover depicting the least threatening looking people ever, the title did actually hold true. Lethal Enforcers had you assume control of a Chicago Police Department officer named Don Marshall as he worked against a major crime organisation that had invaded the town. The game was your typical light gun shooter and was viewed from a first person perspective where you would shoot your way through armoured criminals while avoiding friendly fire on other officers or civilians. Players would start off with a standard service revolver but could acquire upgraded weapons throughout the game such as shotguns, assault rifles and even a grenade launcher. Now Lethal Enforcers actually got itself into some controversy due to its photorealistic imagery and was a main focal point of the 1993 US Senate hearings on video games alongside other controversial games like Night Trap and Mortal Kombat. Even so, the game was incredibly successful, often topping lists as one of the highest grossing games of its time. The series would receive two further games, Lethal Enforcers 2 Gunfights in 1994 and Lethal Enforcers 3 in 2005. Lethal Enforcers 3 would mark their latest entry in this franchise, and since its release, it seems there hasn't been any news since. Konami would follow up Lethal Enforcers with Rocket Knight Adventures in 1993. Rocket Knight Adventures was just as it sounded, a platforming adventure where an opossum knight had his very own rocket pack and sword, which he used to shoot energy projectiles to stop enemies. The main character, Sparkster, actually went on to become one of Konami's official mascots, 
often appearing in several Konami advertisements and game manuals for a few years following the game's release. Rocket Knight Adventures went on to receive critical acclaim, with many praising its music and graphics. The game would be followed up by a direct sequel, Sparkstar Rocket Knight Adventures 2, as well as its own spin-off, Sparkstar. After that though, there was a long drought, and many considered it another one of Konami's abandoned franchises. But that was until 2010, when the series would get a revival after British studio Climax Group developed and released Rocket Knight, which acts as a sequel to the Sega Genesis game Sparkstar Rocket Knight's Adventure 2. This latest game stuck to the traditional gameplay of the series, having Sparks to fight his way through linear platform levels. This revival was welcomed by fans and received decent reviews from critics. Unfortunately, it seems that we may have to wait even longer for another revival, as there hasn't been any news regarding the Rocket Blasting Opossum since. Konami would enter back into the sporting game industry with these next franchises. The first of which went by the name Jikyo World Soccer in Japan, or International Superstar Soccer for the rest of the world. This was your standard football game and featured numerous modes such as your standard open game mode, International Cup which looked to emulate the FIFA World Cup, and even a World Series mode where all teams played against each other in a round robin tournament. Because FIFA hadn't licensed out any of its players or teams, Konami created fictional names to represent real players. The franchise would release countless games over its short lifespan. And while the games themselves never were deemed anything special, I have to admit, they posted some absolute bangers. Unfortunately, upon releasing International Superstar Soccer 3 in 2002, Konami would pull the plug on the franchise. But while this may have placed this franchise in the dead tier, it wasn't the last time Konami would turn towards the sport of football or soccer. And funnily enough, their next franchise would demonstrate just how big the world game truly was. That's right, Konami would follow up International Superstar Soccer with another set of soccer games. What Konami most likely hadn't realised at the time, however, was just how big this series would end up becoming. I'm sure pretty much everyone watching this knows of this franchise. It's not only one of the most popular gaming franchises in history, but it's also Konami's most successful series to date. Pro Evolution Soccer, or PES for short, was a series of football simulation games that have consistently been released for almost three decades. The franchise was initially referred to as Winning Eleven, with the first game taking us all the way back to 1995. These earlier games were officially licensed by the J-League, Japan's Premier League of Football, and the gameplay featured fully 3D rendered graphics. This series, much like International Superstar Soccer, released year after year up until 2001, at which point the series would finally adopt the iconic name Pro Evolution Soccer in the West. From here, the series would only grow in popularity, often being compared to EA's FIFA series and what many consider the biggest sporting rivalry in gaming history. History. Konami would continue the production of PES games year by year, and this would continue until 2022, when Konami would once again rebrand the series, now going by the name eFootball. The name wasn't the only thing that changed though, as both the yearly releases as well as paid games ceased to exist. In their place was a free-to-play football platform fueled by DLC. Now while this change sounds like a positive for consumers, I mean who doesn't love free games, the resulting reception of this announcement couldn't be any worse. Fans and critics blasted the game for its atrocious graphics, lack of content, and laggy engine. Upon its release, it would not only become the lowest rated game of 2021 on Metacritic, but also the worst rated game on Steam a day after launch with a whopping 92% of its reviews being negative. Now despite this rough start, the PES or eFootball franchise has sold over 111 million copies worldwide, in addition to 400 million mobile downloads, cementing it as Konami's most successful game franchise in history. It most definitely deserves a spot in the flagship tier. Now after two football games in a row, Konami decided to switch things up. Oh, you thought I meant genre? Well, unfortunately not, as Konami was on a hot streak with their sporting games, with their next one being NBA In The Zone. This set of games were your standard basketball games, dating all the way back to 1995 with NBA In The Zone for PS1. After the franchise's second release, the series would adopt a yearly naming scheme and also started using NBA players on the covers to help endorse and spread the appeal of their games. Every game had licensed NBA players, and with each new release, new features were added like creating player sections and multiple new modes such as slam dunk contests and three-point shootouts. After releasing five games in the series, Konami would follow it up with NBA Starting Five in 2002. This would unfortunately the latest and most recent release in the series, meaning it's more than likely a dead franchise. The RPG genre was on the rise during the 90s, with some of the biggest franchises, think Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy, essentially helping put certain gaming companies on the map. Konami, upon seeing this, looked to develop their own RPG series, centering around themes of politics, corruption, and mystical crystals known as true runes. The first game in the series, 
Sui Koden, which was released back in 1995, played like your traditional RPG, with players moving characters across a landscape, advancing the plot by completing tasks and talking with other characters. What was unique about this game was the sheer number of characters the heroes could recruit, that being up to 107 new characters, although it should be noted that not all of these were actually playable characters. For the most part, the game was received well and would become the beginning of a long-running series of games. In total, the franchise released five mainline games, six spin-off games, as well as one compilation. This takes us to the year 2012, when the latest game, a spin-off game called Genso Sui Koden, when the latest game, a spin-off called Genso Sui Koden, would release as a Japanese exclusive. While this sounds like another dead end, in recent years it seems like Konami has started to revive that fr this franchise, announcing not only a 2023 HD localization of the compilation, but a wholly separate spiritual successor titled Uyuden Chronicle 100 Heroes, which has been slated for a 2024 release. In saying this, I still don't think it's nearly consistent enough to reach mainstay status, and due to the niche nature of the franchise as a whole, I think it belongs more so in the It Exists here. Konami would dive back into the racing genre with its next release, GTI Club in 1996. GTI Club gave players the choice of numerous cars, and for the time, these were some of the most unique car choices within a racing game. Races also took place in Eurocentric cities, which were non-linear, allowing players to take shortcuts through alternative routes such as tunnels and back alleys. This ability to free roam around the environment was revolutionary for the time, and it certainly helped with the game's immense success, with GTI Club securing itself the third spot amongst the most successful arcade games that month. The series would follow up with two sequels, as well as the HD port of the original GTI Club that was released for the PlayStation Network in 2008. Unfortunately, due to the license having expired, this game is no longer available for purchase, and in a similar sense, this franchise as a whole no longer seems to be in Konami's field of view. Now upon seeing the potential in the RPG genre from series such as Enix's Dragon Quest, Squaresoft's Final Fantasy, and even their own Sui Coden, Konami decided it was about time they delved back into the genre. The resulting product was Vandal Hearts a turn-based tactical RPG that took place in your typical grid-based battlefields, where certain spaces were blocked by either water, trees, or buildings. It was a fairly typical tactical RPG, using a side-by-side -side format in which players would move all their characters first before giving the AI its chance at a turn. The game itself would go on to receive mixed but generally positive reviews, and while it wasn't a breakout success at the time, it did eventually receive both a sequel in Vandal Hearts 2, as well as a prequel in Vandal Hearts Flames of Judgment. Konami made plans to release a Vandal Hearts game for the Nintendo DS, but these plans were eventually cancelled. While it's been over a decade since the franchise's most recent game, there may still be some hope for this franchise. For now, I think it can slot into the zombie tier. Now in what can only be described as good-hearted fun, we have Poi Poi, a party action fighting... Um, honestly, I'm not even sure what I'd categorize this game as. It was simple in nature, as it had four players battle each other using various props like rocks, logs, and even blocks of ice in a variety of different environments. Each character had their own unique strengths and weaknesses, and the environments themselves had numerous hazards that players had to avoid. For the most part, the game was praised as some good light-hearted fun, and an absolute blast to play with friends. A sequel called Poi Poi 2 would release a year later and feature much of the same as its predecessor. Following this though, the series would seemingly fall off the face of the planet, never to be seen again. Now it had been a while since Hudson Soft released a franchise, but coming into 1997, they were back on top after releasing Bloody Roar. Bloody Roar, or Beastarizer, which is a terrible name if I'm being honest, was a fighting game that centred around Zoanthropes, a group of warriors who had the ability to transform into half-human, half-animal beasts. Upon charging the beast indicated to fall, players would be able to enter beast mode, which opened up more fighting moves, allowed for better jumping ability, and recovered 3% of the character's life energy. The game garnered praise for these unique aspects, and would spawn a further 4 sequels, ending with Bloody Roar 4. Following this, the series would get adapted into its very own manga, but outside of that, not much has been heard from Konami regarding this long lost fighting series. Now this isn't to say there's no demand for a new title. In fact, very recently, Ed Boon, the co-founder of Netherrealm Studios, asked a question on Twitter. The question was simply, which fighting game has been away too long and needs a comeback? While he listed four choices, the responses in the comments highlighted one particular game, that being none other than Bloody Roar, showing that there's definitely an audience waiting for a new iteration. I guess it's up to Konami if these calls ever get answered though. Now in this next section of the video, we will quickly discuss Bimani's set of music-based rhythm games. Each of these series has a unique way of playing, and often detaches players from typical handheld controllers, instead making them use their whole body to control the games. This sector of Konami was originally called the Games and Music Division, but changed its name to Bimani in honour of the division's first and most successful game, Beat Mania, and it's here where we'll begin. Modelled after nightclub DJs and mixing boards, Beat Mania allowed players to spin the music with five activated keys in a turn 
Table. This series was the first Bimani game, and over the years has received multiple updates, first with Beatmania 2DX, which added an additional two keys as well as the short-lived Beatmania 3, which added a foot pedal. It has remained Bimani's most popular series, with Beatmania 2DX releasing consistently to this day. Now upon seeing the success garnered by Beatmania, Bimani came back the next year with a new type of music game. This particular game involved players stepping to musical songs on a dance platform that used four pressure sensitive arrow pads. That series was Dance Dance Revolution. And while Beat Mania is considered the most successful Bimani series, Dance Dance Revolution is commonly considered the most well known series outside of Japan with the series expanding to include well over 100 versions of the game as well, as its own short-lived offshoot series called Dance Dance Revolution Solo, which added an additional two arrows on the dancing stage. A new year meant a new Bimani series, this time going by the name Pop & Music. Pop & Music played as an easier and more simplified beat mania, with larger, more colourful buttons, no turntable and easier note patterns. Pop & Music is stylized with cute, cartoony characters, and the music used matches this theme. The series has continued to this day, and is one of the more popular Bimani series of games. Now alongside pop and music, Bimani would release yet another series, this time focused on certain instruments. The first of these was a plastic guitar with three buttons and a strum bar, while the other was a set of drums that had been modelled after modern digital drum kits. The series which accompanied these simplified instruments would go on to become known as the Guitar Freaks and Drum Mania series. Now despite these games being released separately, Konami still markets the series as one. This series, like many of the Manis, has consistently been released to this day. Now, what may be the most complex looking game in this series of music games, we have Jugby. The games used an arrangement of 16 buttons in a 4x4 grid for gameplay, with the goal being to tap in the correct button within the grid. It's remained a majority Asian based game, but has had a few localization attempts during the late 2000s. And the last Mamani series I wanted to mention goes by the name Sound of Voltex, which was first released back in 2012. The gameplay involves numerous colored buttons as well as two knobs that are used to mimic a DJ controller. The buttons are simply pressed or held, while the knobs had to be adjusted on cue with lasers which quickly moved left and right across the track. Now with all of these series it's hard to place them individually, and I know there are plenty more like Reflect Beat, Keyboard Mania, Para Para Paradise and so on. I chose just to mention the larger more popular Bimani series, as a lot of the smaller subseries are either Japanese exclusives or have been discontinued by now. For the most part, all of the ones mentioned technically could be placed within mainstays or flag due to their yearly release and popularity within arcade settings, but I think I will just place the Bamani name itself into the flagship tier to represent their long lineup of popular music games. Oh, would you look at the time? I guess it's time to- <laughs> Now I have a, well, I'm not even sure if it's a hot take, but when it comes to card games, I think Yu-Gi-Oh is certainly superior to something like Pokemon. Activate, blasting the ruins. <laughs> On the other end though, when it comes to video games, the Yu-Gi-Oh ones are uh, 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 but regardless of my preference, let's talk about this behemoth of a franchise, and in particular, its long list of video games. The original source material was actually a manga written by Kazuki Takahashi. I'm sure we all know the story as it followed Yugi Moto, a timid young boy who had solved the puzzle of an ancient item known as Millennium Puzzle. From there, it's all about shadow games and locating the other Millennium items while helping the ancient pharaoh regain his memories. Now that's cool and all, but what Yu-Gi-Oh is most likely known for is the addictive and fun Duel Monsters card game that came along with it. We all know it, you draw 5 cards, you play them on the field, you activate trap cards and get bodied, I mean, we've all seen the show. And you can imagine what video games are like in relation to that. That's right, you get to play the actual trade. Wait, what the fuck is this shit? In actuality, the first Yu-Gi-Oh game was nothing like the manga or the anime. The Yu-Gi-Oh Monster Capsule Breed and Battle spelt it out for you in its title. You would breed up certain monsters and then take them to battle on a grid that mimicked a chessboard. Monsters would have their own special abilities as well as movement limits and attack and defense points. It wasn't until 1999 with the release of Yu-Gi-Oh Forbidden Memories that the series would finally make it to the west and follow that traditional story and gameplay format. This game in particular went on to sell over 2.5 million copies, making it the best selling game at that point and cementing the gameplay format of the majority of the games to come. As of the current day, the franchise is close to 60 games under its name, with those selling over 23 million copies, not including free mobile downloads. Konami themselves have stated that the Yu-Gi-Oh franchise makes up for some of the company's biggest profits, who not only own the video game franchise but also manage the trading card game, with the series as a whole valued at over 19 billion. This beloved franchise is without a doubt a Konami flagship. Now if we're talking about popular franchises, then look no further than the Pokemon series. Upon its release in 1996, the franchise would explode in popularity, and to this day remains the highest grossing media franchise in the world. It should be no surprise that certain companies hope to capitalize on this immense success by developing clones of these games. And Hudson Soft, believe it or not, was actually guilty of doing this 
Genesis when they released the Robopon games in 1998. If there's one thing Hudson Soft got to first though, it was the naming of their games. In a similar fashion to the Pokemon series, the Robopon games were released as a set, each with their own unique name. The first of these was the Robopon Sun, Star and Moon versions, which funnily enough have all become Pokemon games much later on. While the gameplay might mimic Pokemon, the story behind it certainly did not. Players followed a child named Cody, whose grandpa upon retiring gave him the family business. This business was a Robopon dispatching company. Cody would then travel around Brombo Island, collecting Robopons and battling against the Legend 7, who were the top ranked Robopon collectors on the island. The game garnered generally positive reviews, but as you'd expect, many critics just passed the game off as a Pokemon clone, and most definitely not a superior one. The original game would be followed by an RPG spin-off in 1999, before getting its very own sequel with Robopon 2 Ring and Cross versions. Again, these shared very obvious similarities with the Pokemon series, and only ever got a mixed reception. Following the sequel, the series like many others, has seemingly ceased to exist. Now by this point, Konami had tried its hand at pretty much everything. They'd published racing games, platformer games, sports games, and plenty of shooters. But if there was one genre that they seemingly stayed away from, it would without a doubt be the horror genre. At least, it seemed that way until 1999, when Konami would seemingly out of nowhere release a game that would act as the catalyst for one of the most influential and exceptional gaming franchises in gaming history. Silent Hill is a franchise that is often considered to be one of the best survival horror series ever, and if you've ever had the chance to play this series, I'm sure you can understand why. The very first Silent Hill followed Harry Mason as he searched for his missing adopted daughter in a fictional town fittingly named Silent Hill. While the game incorporated combat and puzzle solving into its gameplay, it was the game's haunting atmosphere compounded by the lack of a HUD and psychological horror elements that truly helped it garner the recognition it deserved. Now despite the game going on to receive universal acclaim, the sales figures that accompanied the sprays didn't quite match up. As of the current day, the first Silent Hill has been stated to have sold 2 million copies, which is by no means a small amount, but if we were to compare it to rival survival horror series take Resident Evil for example, we can see that there was certainly a large discrepancy. This didn't stop Konami though, as they would continue to release games for the Silent Hill series throughout the years. What I should note is that the first four games in the franchise were developed by an internal group fittingly named Team Silent. But following Konami's decision to shift production of the games towards Western developers in 2005, the original Team Silent disbanded. The games to follow, while decent and carried the same name, never did live up to the prestige of those first four games. This continued up until 2012, which also marked the last year a fully complete Silent Hill game would release. Coming into 2014, Konami would unveil their latest plans regarding the Silent Hill franchise, and it came in the form of a short teaser demo called PT. Initially developed by Hideo Kojima, the golden boy of Konami, this free download was but a small taste test of the upcoming game Silent Hills. This short demo was everything you'd hoped for, and truly felt like a step in the right direction, garnering universal acclaim upon its release. Unfortunately, it was at this point that the disruption between Kojima and Konami began, ultimately resulting in him leaving the company. As a result, Silent Hills would be cancelled, as well as PT being removed from the PlayStation Store entirely. Now while fan remakes of this demo exist, it left a sour taste in the mouth of Konami and the fans, and for years the franchise lay dormant. But thankfully, in what can only be described as a miracle, on the 22nd of October 2022, Konami would announce not only a new Silent Hill film, but three separate Silent Hill games, accompanied by their own teaser trailers. This was pretty much Christmas for any Silent Hill fan. Now while one of them is a remake of the iconic Silent Hill 2, the other two titled Silent Hill F and Silent Hill Town 4 were entirely new entries into the franchise. Now while none of these games have a set release date yet, it does give hope to a franchise that was slowly fading away into the fog. With over 9 million copies sold, this franchise, while it wanted to be flagship, most likely can only slot into mainstays for now. Konami would continue with the survival theme. This time though, they would drop the horror part of it. Lost in Blue was a series of survival video games, often revolving around some castaways being stranded on a desert island, forcing them to salvage and scavenge for resources to survive. The series began in 1999 and was known as Survival Kids or Stranded Kids at the time. The original game set the groundwork for the rest of the series, having players keep track of their hunger, thirst and fatigue while they accomplished simple survival tasks like eating, drinking, sleeping, gathering, and hunting. The game received fairly positive reviews, and would get its own sequel titled Survival Kids 2. Following the release of this game, the series would rename to Lost in Blue. Now these games followed two young teenagers who had to learn to use the island's natural resources to create a makeshift home while stranded on a deserted island. The franchise would receive another three games before ending off with Lost in Blue Shipwrecked, which interestingly enough was developed by Hudson Soft back in 2008. 
I did notice a recent mobile game by Volcano Force on iOS and Android that went by the same name and for the most part seemed to mimic the gameplay of Konami series. But I couldn't find any connection between the two and to me it just seems like either a clear ripoff or just a mobile game released by an independent studio. If we look at it in this light, the original Lost in Blue series most likely is a dead one. Now Konami's next franchise was Air Force Delta, a series of combat flight simulation games which released back in 1999 for the Dreamcast. The first game was a 3D aerial combat simulator, with players taking flight in one of the many jet fighters available. Missions typically involved either seeking out and destroying enemy aircraft or escorting friendlies to a certain destination. The series has often been compared to Namco's Ace Combat, but unlike Ace Combat, this franchise wouldn't fare nearly as well. The original game only ever garnered a lukewarm reception, and while the series did expand to include a further 5 games, after the release of Air Force Delta Alternative, a Japanese exclusive mobile release in 2007, the series would go on indefinite hiatus. These days it sits alongside the skeletons of other Konami franchises. Silent Scope was an arcade game released back in 1999. As I'm sure is obvious from the name itself, this was a mounted gun game that put the player in the shoes of a sniper during a series of terrorist incidents. To help with the game's realism, the game's cabinet came accompanied by a mounted rifle, meaning players had to shift their body in position to alter where exactly they would shoot. Now while the console versions of the game suffered from mixed reception, the arcade version was praised for its addictive gameplay and realistic feel. It went on to become the second highest grossing arcade game of the month, and started off a series that would include another three games. In 2004, a compilation of the Silent Scope games would release titled Silent Scope Complete, and for many this seemed to be where the series would end, but miraculously, and over a decade later, a new Silent Scope game that had been developed by Tri-Ace would release. This entry, like its predecessor, featured similar gameplay, now with a more anime-like art style. Now, in saying all this, the franchise hasn't seen a new release in almost another decade, but hey, you never know, maybe we'll be seeing another revival just next year. At this point, it would appear that Konami was all in on arcade games, as their next franchise following Silent Scope was Police 911. Now while the on-screen gameplay mimicked your typical shooter, the method in which players controlled their characters was anything but typical. Police 911 came with its very own infrared sensors to help determine a player's location. With this technology, the player was able to dodge around, duck to avoid bullets, and lean out to maximise cover and get a better shot, all while standing on the inbuilt movement pad. This was incredible for the time. And due to these movement capabilities, the game also featured its own unique cover system. As you can imagine, this game blew up in arcades, quickly becoming the second most successful arcade game of the month. It would get its very own sequel barely a year later, titled Police 911 2, which introduced a new cast of characters, with each of them coming equipped with a different handgun. Much like its predecessor, the sequel would go on to garner positive reviews, as well as rank highly as one of the most successful arcade games during its time period. Now while there was never a Police 911 3, Konami themselves stated that Lethal Enforcers 3 was actually the successor to the Police 911 series, meaning that on a technicality, the Police 911 series has been finished. Now while many recognise Hideo Kojima as the godfather of the Metal Gear series, this wasn't all he had been working on. During the late 2000s, Konami had begun development on a game that focused on anime style robots, but with an emphasis on realism, the resulting product would become known as Zone of Enders, a third person hack and slash game that takes mecha combat to outer space. Players would follow along with Leo Steenbuck, a child who becomes the pilot of an advanced mecha known as Jehudi. Leo would travel across different areas and to different space colonies orbiting Jupiter while attacking rogue orbital flames. The game would garner a positive reception upon its release, with many praising its 3D camera work. The series would expand to include its very own spin-off game, and while initially there had been no plans for a direct sequel, in May of 2002, Konami would announce Zone of Enders, the second runner, which was released a year later in 2003. Furthermore, the series would receive its own HD collection in 2012, which included both the first and second games. A third entry into the series titled The Enders Project was announced in 2012, but due to the difficulty experienced with the previous HD ports, this title was unfortunately cancelled. The franchise would get its newest entry in 2018, when the series' second game, Second Runner, would get remastered now going by the name Zone of Enders, the second runner, Mars. In saying this, it does give me some hope for a true revival of the series, and hopefully one day we'll get a brand new original game. Brave Master. I'm sure some of you attribute that name to either a manga or anime series, and if you do, then you're a real one. See, Brave Master was a Japanese manga series written and illustrated by Hiro Mashima, the very same author that would go on to write the smash hit, Fairy Tale, just a few years after completing Brave Master. Now while I call Fairy Tale a smash hit, Brave Master was certainly popular in its own right, selling over 23 million manga copies. 
Its popularity with shonen audiences would not only result in an anime adaption, but also several video games that Konami themselves would publish. These video games range from RPGs to platformers and even a few fighting games. Only two of the six Rave Master games were ever released in the West, and they also happen to be the two latest fighting games. Now, there's not a crazy amount of information on these games in the first place, and while the manga series may have gained the recognition it deserved, it's unlikely that these video games ever got any semblance of that same recognition. By the early 2000s, there were a plethora of sports titles gaining recognition. Heck, even Konami had their very own in the form of Pez. But this next set of games took a different turn. While the sports themselves weren't anything crazy, the characters Konami was bringing in definitely were. The Disney sports games were a collection of four different sporting games, those being basketball, football, skateboarding, and soccer, which as you may have guessed from its title, featured many of Disney's most beloved characters. These games were most likely a one-off collaboration however, as they were all released within the same year, and since then, nothing has been released. Now if there's one thing that Hideo Kojima was known for, it was certainly thinking outside the box, and bringing to life some of the most interesting and innovative ideas one could think of for games. And that's just what he did for this next franchise, Boktai. The series revolves around vampire hunters, who must use sunlight based weaponry to combat evil undead creatures. All of these games were released on the portable systems from Nintendo, and for good reason. See, the cartridges themselves had photometric light sensors in them that measured light exposure. This had a direct relationship with the gameplay with players having to take their, their Game Boy out during the day as the sunlight would charge the in-game solar weapons. Now while this may have been groundbreaking at the time, it really didn't mesh well with players. I mean, come on. Us gamers are used to sitting in dark enclosed spaces where even the slightest ray of sunlight could be lethal. Honestly, this concept wasn't popularized until the advancements of touchscreen phones and the immensely popular Pokemon Go. But it's interesting to know that more than a decade earlier, games that tried to get players outside actually existed. The Boktai series would release four games over four years, ending with Lunar Nights in 2006, which ended up being positively received after having removed the need for the solar sensor model. With Kojima's departure from Konami, it's highly unlikely that we'll get to see more fun out in the sun. But there may be some hope, as Konami would refresh their trademark for the Boktai IP in early 2022. Only time will tell I guess, but for now, it's definitely a dormant series. Now while Bandai may be the king of anime and manga licenses, Konami did have a few of its own, as we've seen with Rave Master, and now with Shaman King. Much like Rave Master, Shaman King, which was written and illustrated by Hiroyuki Take, was extremely popular among the shonen fanbase, selling over 38 million copies as of the current day. Unlike Rave Master though, the numerous video games that had been adapted from the manga and anime weren't all published by Konami. In fact, Konami only ever published 5 games, those being Master of Spirits in 2004, Power of Spirit in 2004, Shaman King Legacy of Games in 2005, and King of Spirits also in 2005. The Master of Spirit games were a set of platform adventure games that were loosely based on the story from both the manga and the anime. Power of Spirit, however, was one of the very few tactical RPG Shaman King games, and was more of a hybrid between a fighting game and a turn-based strategy game. While that may sound confusing in theory, it involved players moving characters in your typical grid-based combat system, but upon facing an enemy, the game would switch to a, to a small fighting arena in which players would directly fight with the enemy. While this was an interesting concept, it wasn't received too well, with critics expressing disappointment in the lack of combos and the seemingly bloated health bars. Shaman King games have seemingly stopped being produced, with the latest dating back to 2006. At the end of the day, while it may have just been a licensed series for Konami, it doesn't change the fact that it's also a dead one. In the Groove was a set of music rhythm games that weren't actually developed nor owned by Konami. In fact, they were created by a wholly separate company going by the name of Rockstar Games. Upon their release though, a lot of people started comparing the gameplay to that of Konami's Dance Dance Revolution. Upon noticing this, Konami would file a lawsuit against Rockstar Games, alleging patent infringement, federal trademark infringement, false advertising, and unfair competition. On the 7th of August 2006, the court sided almost without exception in favour of Konami. This resulted in a settlement between the companies, with the Rockstar Games transferring the IP rights for In The Groove to Konami. Now while this series did get two games out before this happened, due to Konami owning the much more popular Dance Dance Revolution series, this one most likely will never see another release, and to this day has been remembered as an inferior B-grade ripoff series. Wrestling fans are having a field day with this next franchise. Rumble Roses was a professional wrestling fighting game. The catch? The game featured an all-female cast and had them fight each other in both regular and mud wrestling matches. 
So while it did try and capitalise on using sex appeal, the gameplay was actually solid enough to garner praise from critics. It has also been stated that each character contains 10,000 polygons, which for the time was a record for the PS2. Now to no one's surprise, Rumble Roses would get a sequel, barely two years later called Rumble Roses XX. This series added new characters, new locations, as well as a tag team mode and online support through Xbox Live. It would, however, lose out on the story mode that had been included in the first game. The game fared well in Japan, but was very unpopular in the US. Overall, this series has fallen to the wayside. There have been attempts to keep the franchise afloat, with the release of patchy slot games in 2006 and 2008, as well as a mobile spin-off game titled Rumble Rose's Sexy Pinball in 2006. Outside of those small releases though, this series, like many of Konami's, has also been abandoned. Konami's next franchise is a rather obscure one, and would go by the name Coded Arms. Now, Coded Arms was a first-person shooter game that took place in a virtual reality military training simulator that would continuously generate enemies and levels. These were all randomly generated, meaning players didn't know exactly what to expect when loading into each level. Weapons and grenades could be upgraded by collecting a certain number of opt-key files, and because the game itself simulates a computer program, the equipment and items are all named with extensions, much like a conventional computer. You have like .arm, .dfn, .med. Now while the game was considered quite innovative and the graphics were impeccable for the time, it suffered from poor enemy AI and less than ideal control. Despite this mixed reception, many have gone on to state that Coded Arms is actually the best FPS for the PSP console, and it seems Konami still had faith in the series as they would develop and release a sequel titled Coded Arms Contagion, which would release for PSP in 2007. The gameplay mimicked its predecessor, but for some was considered a downgrade as it offered fewer levels, none of which had any random geometry. During this time, Konami had already planned a third entry into the series titled Coded Arms Assault, which they even presented at Sony's conference at E3 2006. In typical Konami fashion though, the game was promptly cancelled with Konami themselves stating there are no current plans to bring Coded Arms Assault to the PS3 at this time. Unfortunately, this means we have yet another dead franchise on our hands. With the release of Sony's new portable system, the PSP, it was undeniable that certain gaming companies would want to get in on the action first. And Konami, in this case, was actually one of the first. And this next franchise, Death Duna, was so hyped up that it was even advertised as the system's first ever killer app. Essentially meaning people were going to buy the system just to access this game. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess you could say it was a killer app, but not in a good way. If anything, it was killing what little hold Konami had left on the gaming market. Death Jr. was an action hack and slash game where players would roam around with an array of different weapons that could be used to attack other people. The game was obliterated on site, with many complaining about the uninspiring graphics, bland gameplay, and terrible camera. But despite all odds, the game did actually end up with two sequels, with the second game in particular adding the option for a second player to join in on the, uh, well, the boring game I guess. None of these games ever managed to garner any special attention, and to this day are often forgotten. Now upon noticing the boundless possibilities of the motion sensing capabilities of the Wii Remote, Konami wanted nothing more than to develop a game that could incorporate these innovative controls. The idea was to develop a game that was easy to pick up with hide and seek style game design. The resulting game was Elevits, an action first person shooter in which players navigated small stages each representing different areas. The idea was to use the pointer to aim and capture Elevits, extracting the energy as Watts. Because a lot of these elements were hidden under objects and such, it was up to the player to manipulate objects in order to find them. This light-hearted game would go on to receive generally favourable reviews, and sold decently well, at least well enough to warrant its own sequel, which was released just two years later, while the general premise for the game remained the same. This sequel, which I actually feature in, switched up its approach, now playing from a top-down perspective, focusing more so on puzzle-like gameplay. The franchise would release a spin-off a year later for iOS devices, which also marks the final entry as of the current day, most likely resulting in yet another dead Konami franchise. Konami would continue to capitalise on the innovative motion controls of the Wii with their next franchise, Coral Rimpa. Coral Rimpa was based on the Marvel game Labyrinth, but incorporated its own unique twists. For one, instead of using little knobs to tilt the level, Coral Rimpa would utilise the Wii Remote itself, tasking players to tilt the level and navigate a sephirable object around a mate to reach the end goal, much like the gameplay of the Super Monkey Ball series. As was the case with a lot of these more modern franchises though, the game received a mixed reception, with players considering it a fun pastime but with an ill-conceived camera. Coral Rinpa would follow itself up with a sequel that had players assist a small ant named Anthony as they helped him locate the Golden Sunflower Seed. The sequel featured a multiplayer race mode as well as an edit mode allowing players to create their own custom stages. The franchise was due for one final release, which was planned for the Nintendo 3DS, but due to the merger between Hudson Soft and Konami, 
This franchise, like the rest, has remained dormant to this day. Now this next franchise is actually a spin-off of a fairly large series going by the name Power Pros. The original series has become increasingly successful and consistent in Japan, often being recognised for its super deformed characters and fast-paced and complex gameplay. It has become the premier baseball series in Japan, often releasing a new game every year and selling well over 70 million copies over its lifetime. But that's not what's being included on this list. See this mainline series has never once been released outside of Japan, and the same can be said for many of its spin-off series. But there was one that made that treacherous journey over to the west, and the name of that franchise was MLB Power Pros, which first released back in 2007. This spin-off series still featured the fan favourite deformed characters and had over 12 different modes for players to mess around in. It was designed to be an introduction to the series with easy pick up and play mechanics. Amazingly, every single MLB player had been recreated within these games, but the game also offered further customization, including changes to hair and facial hair. The game would go on to receive pretty positive reviews and spawned its own sequel, which would release in 2008, and finally an iOS and Android release in 2010. Now, while the original series has continued to power through to this day, it seems like Konami has left this particular spin off series to die. Decker Sports was a series of sports video games released for Nintendo's Wii, with each entry consisting of 10 playable sports. These sports were often unique to each entry, with some repeat sports such as volleyball, which actually appeared multiple times across the games. Much like the immensely popular Wii Sports, Decker Sports utilised the motion controls of the Wii remote and nunchuck to perform actions relevant to each sport. What was different, however, was the setting in which players found themselves. In each Decker Sports game, players would assume the role of a coach, who led one specific team to victory by gauging each team member's own strengths and weaknesses. The series would see the release of three mainline titles as well as three spin-offs, with the latest release, Decker Sports Extreme, releasing back in 2011 for the 3DS. The series seemingly stopped upon its developer Hudson Soft's merger with Konami, and for now it doesn't seem like this series is coming back anytime soon. We have finally arrived at Konami's most recent franchise, which funnily enough was never actually supposed to be owned and distributed by Konami. If I was to ask you about some of the goriest movies out there in cinema today, I'm fairly confident at least a few of you would mention the Saw franchise of movies. They're known for their twisted games or tests, spearheaded by the notorious fictional serial killer Jigsaw, and have become one of the most recognisable horror media franchises in cinema today. Now, After witnessing this, the success of the series' first few films, Twisted Pictures, the production company of the films, partnered with Brash Entertainment, an American video game publisher with plans to develop and create a video game based on the, the Saw film property. The development cycle for this particular game would be shaky to put it lightly, and following Brash Entertainment's announcement that they would be ceasing operations due to financial difficulties, the game in question had been left in a state of limbo. And after four months of uncertainty, Konami would step in, looking at the game as an opportunity to create a spiritual successor to the other horror franchise, Silent Hill. Konami had planned to use the Saw games to tap into the visual intensity of horror, while Silent Hill would explore the psychological elements of horror, essentially meaning that they could cover all ends of the spectrum, while not having them directly compete with each other. The first of two Saw games was released in 2009, and would take place between the first and second Saw films. Much like Silent Hill, the game was a third person survival horror, with elements of the action genre. Players could perform attacks to fend off enemies, all while traversing the asylum and surviving the traps placed around the environment. The game went on to receive a fairly mixed response, with opinions regarding the puzzles ranging from decent enough to terrible, with nearly everyone agreeing that the combat system just completely sucked ass. Even so, Konami would publish a sequel the next year titled Saw 2 Flesh and Blood, which picked up straight off the original game. This game was met with an even worse response, with pretty much everyone agreeing that it was a straight downgrade from its predecessor. There's been some recent news regarding a new Saw game, with Twisted Productions co-founders Berg and Kulse confirming a third game is actually in development. Now I'm unsure if this is through Konami or a completely different company. It seems that despite Konami's wishes to make Saw the next big survival horror game franchise alongside Silent Hill, they soon gave up on that dream. And much like the participants in Jigsaw's Cruel Games, this franchise is struggling to stay alive in the life support tier. Now believe it or not, that's where our list ends. Shocking, I know. Well maybe it isn't so shocking. A lot of you did predict Konami to be up there giving Sega a run for its money. And listing it all out like this, it's certainly, it's definitely comparable. It's honestly sad to see, for certain companies, take Bandai Namco for example, a merger between them seems like a great idea. In Konami's case though, it seems that their merger with Hudson Soft not only killed off any potential for the majority of their franchises, but also seemingly stopped the production of a lot of Konami's own franchises. With their shift towards mobile gaming, gyms, and pachinko halls in the last decade, one can only wonder why Konami strayed so far off the beaten path. 
Even so, there might be some hope for the future, as earlier this year, in April, Konami themselves would announce the opening of a new studio in Osaka, Japan. This studio in particular is said to come with the concept of Creators First, featuring a well-developed environment where creators can demonstrate their full potential. These new offices are said to come with all the necessary equipment, like motion capture tools and sound studios, perfect for the development of products. They would end their statement by saying that this new building would be the core entity in the studio's current and future project, noting that it hopes Konami Osaka will encourage substantial growth over the next 50 years. Now while this sounds like good news, I wouldn't put it past Konami to completely screw this up as well. I mean, looking at this list and the current state of the large majority of their franchises, all I can say is, I mean, they need all the help they can get. Thanks once again for watching guys. If you enjoyed, please do leave a like and subscribe and feel free to check out some of my other videos. I'll catch you all in the next one.